<clears throat> the topic of the talk is uh, EDOF, but quality and functional vision, but without compromise. You know, in, in the many years of using multifocal lenses, to me, uh, I'd say that all the lenses we have right now work. Uh, it's not a question of whether they work, but it's really a question about what is the price a patient has to pay in order to get the range of vision that we're offering them. So quality and function, but importantly, not having the compromise of some other lenses. So we talk about EDOF, we're talking about lenses that are more tolerant of defocus, which means they have an increased depth of focus. Um, there's different principles by which you can achieve this. Now, spherical aberration we will talk about quite a bit because this is becoming an important concept that will become more and more important with different lens designs. Small aperture, this is the AccuFocus style of lens, and this is the only true EDOF lens, as I'll point out, but we'll talk a bit about that and think about how that fits into clinical practice today. Uh, there are diffractive EDOF lenses, and then importantly, there are segmental refractive EDOF lenses, which really offer a, a nice solution. Curiously, we still don't have a, a really good definition for what mean, what constitutes an EDOF lens. The FDA uh, came out with a proposed definition of EDOF, and this spoke about a lens that has an extra point of focus somewhere within 1.5 diopters of its label base power. Uh, and it has significant light energy for that extra point of focus. That's quite a difficult and limited definition, really, because, you know, an extra point of focus, well, already it does not include uh, a lens like the Yaki Focus, because that has no extra point of focus. It's got a range of focus. Trying to define what is significant light energy is actually difficult. You might have a little bit of intermediate vision, but not enough to be functional. Well, is that going to be considered an eat off lens? I think more useful is in the ANSI definition, where they try and refine this a little further. And they talk about having more than half a diopter uh, near vision or intermediate vision than you would get with the monofocal lens. Um, a lens that's superior to a monofocal for intermediate vision, and it tries to define how much superior it needs to be. And of course, importantly, the best corrected distance vision has to be uncompromised, so no worse than a monofocal lens. And interestingly, that very part of the definition would exclude some of the newer lenses from being considered true EDOF lenses. So the dilemma we have really is to choose a lens that will give a range of vision without the compromise. And on this fairly busy slide, you know, I'm making the point that, well, on the, uh, uh, on the bottom right, we have a monofocal lens where you have excellent quality of vision but you have very limited range of vision. So you know you're gonna need glasses for reading and for intermediate. At the other extreme, in the top left of this chart, is a lens like a diffractive trifocal, whether it's a Zeiss or a panoptics or a fine vision. And these are lenses that give an amazing range of vision. These patients can read small print, they can see the car dashboard, and they can see for the distance without requiring glasses. But the price they pay is that there are a lot of unwanted visual phenomena. And pretty much every patient with a diffractive trifocal lens will see halos, whether or not it bothers them. So somewhere on this chart is where we sit with our comfort. Uh, when I was younger and more aggressive, I was up to the top left and trying to give patients a full range of vision because that's what they thought they wanted. But now I spend much more of my time over towards the right trying to work out how I can give a good functional range of vision but really minimize those unwanted visual phenomena that can occur. Another way to think about a categorization of EDOF lenses, multifocal lenses, and the newer category of mono EDOFs is like this, where we have a table that looks at the optical properties that are involved um, and, and then looks at whether they're multifocal EDOF or monofocal lenses. And you, know, you can see in here most of the lenses we know and and there are lenses that span the whole range, and trifocals. Well, they're not really EDOF, but uh, they span the range. And the newer lenses that we're talking about, so we've got the iHance from Johnson & Johnson, which is really a monofocal lens that extends into a little bit of EDOF. Uh, and similarly, we have the lens from Alcon, the Vividi, which again is a monofocal lens that expands a bit into the EDOF territory. And these are primarily refractive lenses, they are not diffractive lenses. And then the other category that we're now seeing entries into is the, the category of full strength diffractive multifocality that using the principles of EDOF to fill out the dips in the defocus curve. 
uh, such as the Johnson & Johnson Synergy lens that's getting some, some air time. Well, the only true EDOF lens that we have really is the small aperture lens. This is the IC8, the AccuFocus lens, which uses the same principle that was used for the corneal inlay to treat presbyopia. And the small aperture truly gives you an extended depth of focus. So this lens does work. To me, it's got a limited application because you're reducing the amount of light getting into the eye, and that does matter. And if we're using this in slightly younger patients, which is certainly my practice profile, you've got the problem that if the patient's pupil gets large enough so that it's no longer covering the edge of the black bit of the lens, patients tend to get a lot of halo problems. And I have explanted more of these lenses than I have implanted, which means I haven't implanted very many, of course, but it just makes the point that they are not without some compromise. So this is not a routine part of my practice, but certainly for a patient with a highly aberrated eye, an aberrated cornea, perhaps from previous poor quality refractive surgery, this is a nice option because it will reduce the impact of higher order aberrations by always limiting the pupil size. Then we move to the lens that really got people talking about the EDOF category, and this is the Symphony from Johnson & Johnson. But they did a great job at developing this concept of EDOF and having patients become aware of it. Uh, this is a diffractive lens. They might call them echelettes, but this is a diffractive optic uh, that basically modifies the way the diffractive ridges work so that whilst you're still getting almost the bifocality, you're spreading out th that range of vision uh, and reducing the dip between the two points of focus. We'll look some more at this as we go along. Zeiss came out with the AT Lara, which again is a diffractive multifocal lens where the diffractive elements are modified to reduce the separation of the intermediate point and in, in the sort of near range. But importantly, they use modification of the diffractive optics to minimize the dip in the defocus curve between point of focus for distance and for intermediate. And this looks like a lot of information on this graph, but let me make two points from this, and this is very interesting. This makes the point that first, both these lenses, the Zeiss Lara and the Johnson & Johnson Symphony, they are both bifocal, diffractive, multifocal lenses. And this is borne out clearly here. If you look at the middle set of graphs that are modeled on a three millimeter pupil, you can see two points of focus for both the lenses. The, the reason we've got two columns here is on the left is the ISO model one, which is an ISO model for testing lenses where you have no spherical aberration. On the right is ISO model two, which is a model that actually includes spherical aberration of the cornea of 0.28 micrometers. So the two interesting features from this graph are that shows us that both these lenses behave like bifocals. Now for a very small pupil, once your pupil gets down to two millimeters, as we're seeing at the top, the bifocality is less marked. Once you get down to a large pupil down at the bottom, these are just like bifocals. But the other point to make from this graph is that correcting for spherical aberration does matter. And the AT Lara does not perform as well as the Symphony, uh, particularly as the pupil gets larger because the Symphony corrects for spherical aberration. So another concept and principle which is becoming increasingly important even though it's not a new principle, is the use of spherical aberration to expand the range of focus. And we have this lens from Italy, the Mini Well by Cifi, uh, which is a very clever and complex optical design. It uses Zernike polynomial uh, four and six, so positive and negative spherical aberration in different rings on the lens, so that you end up with not a lot of increase in the total aberrations of the eye, but you using both positive and negative spherical aberration to expand the depth of focus. And this can work well. In this study, the authors looked to demonstrate what kind of depth of focus you could achieve if you do increase positive and negative spherical aberration in the right balance. And they were able to demonstrate five diopters depth of focus, which is more than three and a half times the untreated range of focus by using um, level four and six for collaboration. So it is possible to get a lot of spherical collaboration reduction to give very good expansion of the range of focus. So the principle works. Here's another example of the application of the principle of spherical collaboration to achieve depth of focus. This is a recent paper with Pablo Atal's group 
where they're using the Calhoun light adjustable lens implanted into both eyes and in one eye they're going back and deliberately inducing increased spherical aberration to increase depth of focus. And if you look at this graph, at the very left-hand side of it, this shows you the expansion of the depth of focus for the eye that has increased spherical aberration. So it is something that can work and does work and does give depth of focus, but there's a price to pay. And what this slide demonstrates is that when you have increased depth of focus created with spherical aberration, the vision is just not as sharp. So you can see on the left-hand column of letters here, an example of when there is no spherical aberration in the optical system. The letters are sharp, but they're sharp over a very limited range of defocus. And then as you go along, you see different combinations of spherical aberration. And on the far right, you can see an example where you have both positive and negative spherical aberration in the optical system. When you do this, you can see the letters are kind of, you can make them out over a much wider range of defocus, but they're never quite as sharp. So there is some loss of the quality of sharpness when you increase spherical aberration. There is a price to pay. This has been going on for a long time, and Kruger and his group uh, demonstrated the, the use of spherical aberration to give increased depth of focus some years ago. We know this occurs in the natural process of accommodation. So when the crystal lens accommodates in a healthy young eye, we achieve near vision both through a dioptric shift in the power of the eye, but also through an increase in the spherical aberration created by the change in the shape of the crystal lens. One interesting way that we can use spherical aberration, and that I use it in laser corneal refractive surgery, is to combine spherical aberration with a little bit of monovision. And what this slide demonstrates is that if you have a system with no spherical aberration, so that's the top set of letters, there's no spherical aberration, and you have no defocus, so the top left set of letters. The letters are sharp, it looks good, there's no problem. But then if you move across towards the middle here, we've got minus one diopters of defocus. At the top is what you see with no spherical aberration. At the bottom is if you induce some spherical aberration. And you start to make out that the letters are actually better when there's defocus for myopia. If you combine that bit of myopia with some spherical aberration, the vision is better than without the spherical aberration. So we can use this. For example, we can give a little bit of monovision, and in the eye with the bit of myopia for the monovision, we selectively increase the spherical aberration within a narrow range and get improved quality of distance vision. It's a useful way to use spherical aberration. And this is an important concept as we start to move into using the new wave of mono EDOF lenses. So I'd summarize direct collaboration by saying that it does work to increase depth of focus, no question, it can be done, but there is a price to pay, you do lose some quality of vision. Negative direct collaboration is like giving a central near ad, positive is like a peripheral near ad. Uh, there is some loss of the sharpness of distance vision if you increase direct collaboration. We should probably limit it to about 0.3 micrometers and combining it with a small amount of myopia uh, is a useful way to use direct collaboration. So let's move and talk about this new category of lens, the mono EDOF intraocular lens. Uh, these are lenses that are behaving like monofocal lenses but giving a bit of intermediate vision. These defocus curves, uh, well, on top left is for a monofocal. It's easy. You've got a single point of focus. Uh, that's straightforward. Uh, top right is a trifocal lens, three points of focus. Now down at the bottom right is an example of the defocus curve for a monofocal EDOF lens. What you can observe is that the, it exhibits a single point of focus still, but you broaden the shape of the curve, so you expand the range over which there is reasonable focus. That's how it works. But you'll also notice that the height at the peak of this curve is not as high as it was for a monofocal. You have lost some of the distance vision which may not reach a critical threshold, but there is some loss of the distance vision. Here's a model of the iHANS lens from Johnson & Johnson, which is the first monofocal EDOF lens to make it to market in Australia. Now, this behaves like a lens with a little blob of central near ad. Now, whether it's central plus power or actually increased spherical aberration over a central zone doesn't really matter. It behaves like a central near ad. And so you can demonstrate that for a very small pupil, the power of the lens is greater than for a larger pupil. 
and that makes sense. And if we look at how much vision you achieve with this lens and compare it, say, with the Symphony, it gives you much less expansion of the depth of focus. And this is intentional, this is its design. It gives you maybe half a diopter, a bit less, where a Symphony probably gives you one diopter expansion of the range of focus. Just so a Johnson & Johnson eye hands lens. The Alcon lens, uh, I think, very similar in optical design. Uh, again, you've got a monofocal lens with some change in the profile, and they talk about this wavefront shaping, so you get some changes over the central part of the lens. But to me, this probably has to be optically the equivalent of a central near ad. And again, you get some expansion in the range of focus, perhaps a little more than you're seeing with the Johnson & Johnson eye hats, probably getting 0.75 diopters here with the Alcon lens, which is nice for a bit of extra intermediate, but certainly not enough to give patients reading vision unless you combine it with some mono vision. And again, uh, this is to make the point that when you do this, when you increase some spherical aberration, you will lose a little bit for the distant distance vision. And this is shown here for the Alcon uh, Vividy lens, that the distance vision is not quite as good as it is when compared with the monofocal. So another category of lenses is the idea of combining diffractive optics with EDOF principles to expand the range of focus for a diffractive multifocal lens. And there's a lens from Santon that's sold in various parts of the world. And essentially what it does is it uses a monofocal lens, a refractive lens, and superimposes some diffractive technology to achieve an expanded range of focus. And you get defocus curves like this. So the top is from monofocal. The middle is for uh, um, the Santon Edof lens, and at the bottom is a lens like Symphony, where you, you get almost a bifocality. So this is the combination of diffractive optics with refractive to expand the range of focus. And as a principle, uh, it has merit. Uh, we have lenses now like the Johnson & Johnson Synergy, which is a full-strength diffractive multifocal lens, where they've combined this with Edof principles to effectively fill out the space between the peaks in the defocus curve. So you're filling out the inter intermediate vision for a lens with a strong near head. And this is gaining some popularity. Uh, I think what we need to demonstrate more is the risk of patients suffering with halos because it's still a full strength diffractive lens and patients will get halos with it. Then we move to a different kind of lens completely, which is the Oculentis asymmetric segmental refractive lens. This is a purely refractive technology that has specific benefits. And this family of lenses from Oculentis is the Comfort, the MF15, both custom and off the shelf. These come in Torix, and also the Femtis EDOF lens that we'll talk some more about. Now, these are lenses that are kind of hard to understand optically. And this may be a slightly confusing slide to show, but it explains how this lens works as an EDOF lens. Essentially, if you look at the MTF, modulation transfer function in both a vertical and horizontal plane in this lens. So not a single plane, which is what's often used, but in two planes, you get completely different curves. And that makes sense because you can imagine if you're moving through different parts of the lens, if you're moving through this part as compared through this part, you will get a different curve. And that's what we're seeing here. And if you take these curves and mathematically add them, you will end up with the defocus curve that looks very much like that uh, there. Um, the defocus curve that looks very much like a symphony lens, for example, a true Edof lens. So these oculentis lenses are behaving just like an Edof lens. They're not really bifocal lenses. And that's a very useful principle for us, particularly based on a refractive technology. So we're not losing anything for the distance vision. The other point I'll make is that when we a show on data about lenses, we're often given MTFs. And MTFs do have some resemblance to how a lens will perform, but a lens in clinical practice will almost always outperform what the MTF suggests because of interpolation and the fact that the MTFs we're shown are normally either monochromatic or in a single plane. So that in optical quality testing, ideally the MTF is done in multiple planes and uh, in monochromatic but also white light will allow us to get a better idea of how a lens will perform in the clinical world. The Oculentis family to me is very useful because with a purely refractive technology, 
we're able to get a defocus curve that is just like an EDOF lens, but with better near vision than we're seeing with the monofocal EDOF lenses. I mentioned the Femtus lens. Uh, to me, this is a really exciting technology. This is taking the Oculentis refractive segmental platform and modifying it so that it can be attached to the anterior capture directus, which gives us perfect fixation and perfect alignment with visual axis. And importantly, we always have the same effective lens position in the eye. And this performs extremely well as an EDOF lens in our early data. And, you know, to, for an EDOF lens to work, we need patients to be getting adequate functional vision. Uh, with the Femtus, which is the same as the MF15, uh, the Oculentis Comfort, in our recently published study, we had 60% of patients never wearing glasses. They just didn't wear them at all. And the rest sometimes wore them for reading vision when the light was not good. And that's expressed here by showing the number of patients who can achieve 6.6 six and N6 when they have this family of lenses, the Oculentis MF15 platform in their eye. And importantly, we started this talk by talking about the idea of functional vision, but without compromise. So we have to mention quality of vision and unwanted visual phenomena. Now, with a subjective questionnaire, our results were such that no patient had any feature that got anywhere near being a bad outcome in terms of their subjective self-assessment of their quality of vision with the Femtus Edof comfort lens. And if we look at uh, the halos and glare that can occur with different presbyopia correcting lens platforms, including Edof lenses, because if it's a diffractive Edof lens, they will get halos. They may not bother them, but they will see halos. Uh, importantly, with the Oculentis refractive segmental design, we find such a low rate of glare, halos, unwanted visual phenomena that it's almost non-existent. And this was our published data when looking at the Femtus lens, which is the far right-hand column, so that there was almost unrecordable uh, incidence of halos and glare with this lens. Uh, even better than we found with the Oculentis Comfort, the MF15 implanted routinely in the capsular bag, perhaps because of the relationship of the lens with the posterior surface of the iris. So that's my overview today of EDOF lenses and the technology involved. Um, and to me, I, I'm looking forward to getting back into elective surgery and back into practice so we can start using more of these lenses. Thanks very much for your attention. I appreciate the chance to talk like this and look forward to seeing your comments and answering some questions.